So let's actually let's talk about the science here, and, and it's specifically as it relates to some of your prior work in food, right? Um, and you talked about things like nutritionism, right? And we got into this weird point with food where you know, we, we, we invented white bread, yeah. where we took things out, and then we realized, <laughs> oh, we took out the healthy things, and then we had nutrient-enriched white bread. Right. And so, as you put it, you, you put the, the problem and the solution in the same package. Same neat package, yeah. Um, and, and, and so the point being that we had this clever science, but maybe at all along nature was, had it right to begin yeah. with. So let's make an analogy here to mushrooms. We're doing all this research on psilocybin. Is it possible that if we focus on this one nutrient, yeah. the psilocybin, are we missing something important it's, in the whole mushroom? It's completely possible. I don't know the answer for sure. I mean, there are actually two chemicals in psilocybin. There's psilocin and psilocybin. Right. But there may be other compounds too, and they may be relevant. And right. they, and also there may be different compounds. That, you know, uh, Psilocybe cubensis, which is the main mushroom most people use, is only one of 150 different psilocybin species. Uh, does azurescence have other stuff in it? It seems to have some slightly different effects. Um, so, and we know this in cannabis, right? You know, we know there are two famous cannabinoids, THC and CBD, but mm -hmm. there are many, many more. Yeah. Um, when people started fooling around with um, uh, beta carotene, or you know, these they, they, they thought that you know the key to the carrot is this this uh, antioxidant called beta carotene, and they and they turned it into a pill and they gave it to people, thinking it would help them, and in fact, uh, it hurt them. Uh, the the death rate from cancer went up in, in people who were eating the supposedly good nutrient. Well, it turns out that there are, you know, 49 other carotenes in a carrot, and, um, uh, and we haven't studied most of them. So we should be very respectful of the, uh, of the mushroom as nature gives it to us, um, and at least explore the possibility that there are other things going on that are valuable. Um, if, you know, there are cases when, you know, we synthesize things successfully and effectively, um, but our tendency is, is, uh, to, is reductive. And, you know, for science, you need to be reductive, right? You need to isolate that chemical to, to perform a drug trial. Um, but I think we should be aware that there may be, you know, same, the difference between peyote and mescaline. I mean, you know, has anyone really explored that? I don't know the answer. But the other parallel from food that I think is really relevant, and I'm glad you brought this up, is um, eating alone. Mm. You know, we Very good um, point. one of the one of the main trends in Western food is the move from eating as a communal act to eating as something you do in the car. You know, forty six percent of meals are eaten alone now. Twenty percent are eaten in the car. And this kind of atomized individualistic eating turns out not to be very good for your health um, because people eat too much when they eat alone. Whereas when you eat at a table with other people, other things are going on. You're talking. You're conversing. And and you eat in a more moderate way. And um, so there's something about socializing an experience that can make it healthier. Right. And that may be true with psychedelics too. Yeah, I'm glad you're bringing this up actually. Um, and we, we look in the traditions, a lot of the times psychedelics are taken in groups, ayahuasca circles, yes. communal, uh, or in the case of if we go to Gabon and we talk about iboga, it's actually the communal aspect of that is almost reversed. There's one person in getting initiated, and this may not be true in all Bwiti traditions. It's very diverse in itself, but there's an initiate, and then the entire community is around you, supporting mm -hmm. you. And so the community aspect, not to mention integration and all this other aspect, uh, and, and right now it, with the FDA approval process, where we're going toward is single person with two guides, which it seems- It's like single it's person, but not alone. Not alone, right. Yeah, it's like eating with a chaperone at McDonald's. But we don't, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's not really, but. <laughs> but we really don't have a necessarily right now a line of sight to group psychedelic work, which yeah. I think. Well, you know, I, but I, I think that's coming. I think one of the ways you'll deal with the inefficiencies of two therapists uh, and one person, uh, and I think there's some proposals afoot, in, at least I know in Europe. Bob Jesse will send me a memo about this later. Um, if I'm wrong, that um, of, of looking at the possibility of doing group psilocybin mm. as a way to make, uh, you know, uh, that two therapists could actually work on six people at once yeah. uh, or eight people. And I think that's worth exploring. I mean, yeah. certainly that's the ayahuasca model, you're right. And I know uh, MAPS has a study for couples therapy, actually, yeah. where one person in, in the couple has PTSD. Um, and so, and they're actually treating the couple 
collectively because they're both affected by the PTSD. Sure. And, and this gets into the broader dynamics of socially, you know, we're not just isolated individuals. Yeah. We're part well, that, of that, that's true of the cancer studies too. There are people like uh, Catherine right. McLean who, who makes the argument, and it's a very good argument, yeah. that the caregivers can benefit just as much from psilocybin therapy as the person who's dying. And that it, it, it's a whole constellation that's affected by that, by that event. Um, and the grief, um, and there's actually a, a study of um, AIDS survivors uh, with psilocybin that's about to start yes. in San Francisco, um, and that is treating the survivor, not the um, not the patient. Um, so I think there's you know there's so much to more to be learned, and right. there's so many exciting experiments to do, and what's what's really wonderful is that this space has been created by these pioneers, and the and the you know, the willingness of the FDA to go along with this, because um, they have been basically encouraging of the research in recent years, um, that we're going to learn a lot. We're going to learn a lot about the mind and about, you know, the way it works and the way it sometimes fails to work in the next few years. And that psychedelics, in addition to be in being interesting of themselves, are going to prove to be a very powerful tool for understanding addiction and yeah. dying and, um, depression and anxiety and the mind and consciousness and, um, and that's to me is really yes. exciting you know Stan Groff had that uh, the, the, the legendary um, psychedelic psychiatrist um, who's still with us uh, he said once and I remember reading this early in my research and thinking that is ridiculous he said um, uh, that psychedelics or LSD would be for the study of the mind what the telescope was for astronomy and what the microscope was for biology it was really an audacious thing to say, especially then. Um, but actually, I no longer think that's crazy at all. I mean, I think that yeah. um, psychedelics do have very important things to teach us.